Pursuant to House Rule 10.01, this meeting of the Housing Finance and Policy Committee will come to order. Mr. Wilcox, please take the roll. Houseman. Present. Howard. Howard. Tice. Present. Big Badger. Present. Bliss, excused. Gomez. Present. Hassan. Hassan is present. Heinrich. Heinrich present. Her. Her. Jurgens. Jurgens present. Olson. Present. Barr. Present. Ryer. Present. Right. Howard. Present. Perfect, Madam Chair, we do have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, next order of business is approval of the minutes from Tuesday, March 16th. Representative Howard, uh, have you had a chance to review the minutes? I have, so moved, Madam Chair. Representative Howard moves approval of the minutes. Any discussion? If not, members, uh, please unmute yourselves for a voice vote. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The motion prevails and the minutes are approved. Uh, we first of all have House File 1916. Representative Tice, would you like to move your bill? I would, Madam Chair. Thank you. Representative Tice moves that House File 19 1916 be brought before the committee and this bill will be laid over. Representative Tice, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. After talking to several folks, especially in my community and some of the, some of the other greater Minnesota cities, we realized that not only do we have a homeless uh, need, but we also have workforce housing and just to bring other people into our communities. I was talking to Mayor, Mayor Fabian and his, some of his things that he's doing this year is trying to get a multi-family unit built. It's gonna be a smaller unit because Roseau isn't that big, but what they're trying to do is bring people in just to see the community, to see what the jobs are available. They've got digit, Digikey and Polaris especially. And they're really looking to just show them what, what they can have if they move up there in a, I would say a pretty darn cold place. Um, he's also talking about workforce housing. And I know in St. Cloud, I know in some of the other communities too around us, they really have an issue with where are they gonna house folks? We've got so many places that are looking but we've got a lot of manufacturing around us as well. And with that, I'm not gonna say any more because I'm afraid I'll start sneezing and I'll turn it over to either Chad or Scott, whichever one is going next. Thank we you. have Scott McMahon from the Greater Minnesota Partnership. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record. Great, thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Scott McMahon. I'm the Executive Director of the Greater Minnesota Partnership. And I'm honored to be back before this committee uh, to talk about housing in Greater Minnesota. Uh, if you'll recall from my testimony a few weeks ago when I kind of gave the overview of the challenges and opportunities we have in Greater Minnesota, uh, two things that I highlighted. One is that we do have a pretty significant workforce housing shortage on, in a number of our communities. Uh, and a lot of that is driven by just the market realities that we face in Greater Minnesota, where when you look at the construction costs that we face, uh, often the, the value of a newly built house is less than that construction cost. And so financing and getting that, that project built is really challenging. Um, the reality that we face in a lot of our communities though, is that we have, we have houses in our communities that aren't lived in anymore, um, but aren't part of the housing stock because they, they've come under disrepair and uh, you know we, nobody's living in them, they can't live in them. But if we could get them back into the housing stock, they'd be a perfectly appropriate house for somebody. But the challenge we face is that that low value of that house plus the, the fix up cost that, that the community would face, again, exceeds what that market, what that house is, would be valued at when it's done. And so we just have real challenges trying to get those houses taken care of. And so what ends up happening more often than not is that house either continues to stand and falls further into disrepair or gets bulldozed and we just lose, lose the property. So what this program would do would uh, provide grants to cities to put in some of the capital that's needed to bring that house back up to, uh, to a livable standard and to get it back into our housing stock. And the reality is when you look at 
the various government programs that could be there, um, one of the lowest cost, if not the lowest cost program that we could have to get new housing available is to put that minimal cost into, into an existing property that's not used and get it back in the pipeline. So this program would uh, provide $5 million into a grant program for cities in, in greater Minnesota. Uh, it, would, it would cap uh, investments per property at no more than $50,000 and no more than $200,000 per city. We think that this would have a really significant impact on, uh, on the cities that would be able to access this program and would be able to get a number of those houses that again are just sitting there vacant right now back into our pipeline and available for families to move into. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions, but I know uh, Chad Adams from the Southwest Minnesota uh, Housing Partnership can provide greater insight into how, how an investment like this would actually play out when, once it's on the ground. Yes, we also have Chad Adams from the Southwest Minnesota Housing Partnership. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself. Good morning, Good morning Chair Healthman and members of the committee. I'm Chad Adams, uh, the CEO of the Southwest Minnesota Housing Partnership. We've got offices in Slayton and Mankato, uh, Minnesota. And we are a nonprofit community development corporation that provides a full continuum of housing services from housing education and counseling all the way to single family and multifamily development, including new construction and acquisition of properties. Um, and long-term uh, asset owner for a lot of those multifamily properties as well too. I've been the CEO for the partnership for about two years and previously, previously served about 20 years in city government management, most recently in Albert Lee, Minnesota, uh, where I worked with a lot of different stakeholders on workforce housing needs in Southeast Minnesota as well. So I've got some perspective and insight from Southwest, South Central and Southern, Southeastern Minnesota as it relates to workforce housing. Um, so really want to kind of talk a little bit mostly about uh, the need for workforce housing and how this fix up fund uh, might specifically help uh, homeowners and to, to share some statistics with you if you haven't seen those yet. Um, no, I should also note that I was also elected as a co-chair of the Home Toronto Coalition uh, this past year. So I'm representing over 270 endorsing organizations throughout the state as well too. As it relates to the fix up fund, uh, we are in regular contact with communities on a daily basis throughout our region on workforce housing needs. And workforce housing oftentimes, if not always, comes up as the most significant need that a community needs. And some of the uh, barriers that Mr. McMahon mentioned are critical um, to trying to remedy, particularly with that affordability gap and the appraisal gap, which I can speak to a little bit more. Uh, but the aging housing stock of homes is also just a growing issue. And despite the extraordinary demand for new single family homes throughout the Southwest and South Central regions that we serve, the rehabilitation of homes are critical to meeting the workforce needs in greater Minnesota and really do remain more economical than building new construction, particularly with the pre and post pandemic rise in construction costs, which I'm sure you've heard a lot about. Uh, reha rehabbing the homes will also help communities preserve their tax base and avoid substandard nuisance properties from being established that ultimately decrease the market value of neighboring properties, but also becomes very expensive for taxpayers to pay for the demolition of such dilapidated homes. And I've got a lot of experience with that working in the municipal field and cities having to go in and go through that process and spend oftentimes 20 to $50,000 to take down one specific home that's become dilapidated. Uh, it'd be best if we could preserve um, those housing projects into the pipeline, pipeline as Mr. McMahon mentioned. And according to some, to some statistics recently published by the Minnesota uh, Housing uh, Preservation Partnership, I'm sorry, 40% of single family homes were built before 1970 throughout the entirety of the state. Just in the Southern region of the state, which represents South Central and Southeast Minnesota, that number increases to 46%. However, there has been a fair amount of new construction in Blue Earth and Olmstead uh, counties, which are in that region. You take those two counties out, you look at counties like Martin, Terrible, Maurer, and Freeborn, 60% of the homes in the counties, the remaining counties, have been built before 1970. The same thing in the Southwest region of the state, uh, where there's 18 different counties represented, they're amongst the highest um, in the entirety of the state with homes that are built prior to 1970. So it just emphasizes a need for ongoing rehabilitation and repair. And I should also just note that there needs to be a new funding source and program that has a quick turnaround uh, for meeting some of these needs. There are some other existing programs out there 
uh, throughout the state, but um, oftentimes I take a fair amount of time to go through the process. It might be two years down the road until the property owner um, or owner of that home actually sees a benefit. So there is need uh, to get some more funding in the pipeline, but also to diversify the tools uh, that are out there specifically. As Scott had mentioned earlier, a big significant barrier is the appraisal of some of these homes in greater Minnesota. We're oftentimes finding either for a new construction or even for a rehabbed home that the appraised value is twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 less uh, than what it is to cost to construct that home uh, and list it or to basically repair that home and put it back on the market. Uh, so I just really wanted to emphasize that uh, today. And, and certainly I'm open to a lot of questions about the other broader challenges and needs with workforce housing in greater Minnesota. I have testified before this committee about a month ago on uh, construction costs, uh, appraisal challenges, construction trade shortage, uh, just the lack of availability of workforce development, um, housing, affordable housing needs, um, and administration uh, fees that oftentimes developers have to pay uh, for, for a lot of these projects, which I don't view to be a significant challenge in the, the entirety of the barrier of building homes, rehabbing homes in greater Minnesota. But specific, specific, specifically, I just want to just kind of pause and just take any questions uh, to see if you have any uh, other perspectives or insights that you want me to share from, from greater Minnesota. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, members, do we have any questions for either the testifiers or for the bill's office? Mr. Worth? Yes, Madam Chair, Representative Ryer has a question. Representative Ryer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and this question is either for uh, Representative Kais, and thank you for bringing this forward, or for either testifier, whoever uh, it makes most sense. I, I guess I'm wondering if, first of all, if the $50,000 uh, cap is sufficient to uh, bring uh, the, the properties up to the standard that they would need to be, or if that would also require other local investment or other funds. And also, um, I was struck by the um, comment that it, cities are, and towns are spending twenty to $50,000 to tear down dilapidated structures. Is there a, a, a regulatory or legal barrier to using those funds to instead invest in the property? And, and are there different ways to think about that? Thank you. Uh, either Mr. McMahon or Mr. Adams, who, who wants to step up? Well, Madam Chair, I think uh, I think Mr. Adams might be better equipped to, to address the second part of the question. But as to the first part of the question on the fifty thousand dollar cap, um, you know, we're we're trying to see what would happen with an investment opportunity like this. And you know, our general sense is that if it's going to be more than fifty thousand dollars to do it, we may in fact be better if it needs that much work on the house. We may in fact be better off uh, removing that house. Um, but also with the cap of fifty thousand dollars, it allows us to to spread that investment into more communities and have a bigger impact on the total number of properties, rather than limiting the number of properties that can be brought back online. Thank you, uh, Mr. Adams. Uh, do you have a sense of the of the other uh, question? What other um, local funding sources? Yes, and, and Ms. Madam Chair and members of the committee, there aren't a lot of other local funding sources that have been set aside by communities. I don't disagree that some of that funding could be set aside into more preservation, but I, I do believe that most cities are doing that already when they're pairing that with the small cities program. Um, but that's why there's such a, a critical element to need here because there's so much demand and that small cities program is not meeting the entirety of the need. So this fund will be a little bit more direct and appropriated uh, to the direct needs and will be a little more efficient, in my opinion, uh, to avoid those cities from having to spend those twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollar costs on demolition. They could spread that out amongst a number of homes, whether it's support from private investment or other public investment or other grants from the state as well, too. So it would additionally help the leveraging of other capital uh, being brought to the table, whether it's private or public. Representative Ryer, follow up. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to say that I, I really like seeing new approaches and thinking on how to preserve the NOAA uh, resource in um, across the state, uh, both metro and non-metro. I appreciate your focus here. Thank you. Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Tice. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to put my two cents worth in because uh, after the Great Recession, I think it was 2010, 2011, uh, Totally, we did about 13 homes and we bought them anywhere from 20,000 
to 50,000 and then put in um, mostly windows, roof, insulation, doors, just making sure that the house was tight and, and efficient. And most of the time we could do that really reasonably. Um, so I think 50, 50K is a really good place to start. But I think our cities are also recognizing that we don't have the inventory and that we can do it. One of the homes we, we got, I mean, we bought it for 20 grand. It had a lot of um, mold and, and different things into it. And we gutted the whole thing, but, but we sold it. You know, we put maybe 50 or 60 into it, but we sold it at a really nice price because it was a super nice house. And uh, we were getting, getting a lot of questions from realtors. In fact, yesterday I got a call from a realtor friend of mine and he knows we have some rentals. He wants to know if we want to sell because right now is a good time to sell. There isn't a lot of housing. So I think this is a really good time to have something like this out there. Cities are looking for homes. And I think, uh, you know, we can do quite a bit with 50K, with 50,000. But I think that just putting it out there shows the need. And I think we'll get a good response from it. I know a lot of friends that would take advantage of it. Thank you. Uh, further questions, Mr. Worth? Madam Chair, there are no other questions in the queue at this time. Representative Tice, do you have final comments? Just thank you, Madam Chair, for letting me have the opportunity to have this, this bill heard and considered to go into the uh, housing bill. I think it is a need, we know that, and just really appreciate it. Thank you. And this will, uh, 1916, it will be laid over. Right now we have uh, House File 1282, uh, Representative Cagle. Uh, the chair moves that House File 1282 be brought before the committee and this bill also will be laid over. Representative Cagle, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, House File 1282 is an appropriation to help with, um, house, or with infrastructure in uh, manufactured housing communities. Aging and failing infrastructure systems in manufactured housing communities pose the biggest threat to closure and displacement of homeowners across the state. And most of these infrastructure systems were built 50 to 60 years ago and nearing the end of their useful life. The legislature established the um, MH infrastructure fund in 1917 and authorized, authorized the use of, the infra of housing infrastructure bonds for the purpose of replacement of failing systems in 2018. I'm gonna to have to check my notes and make sure that was really 1917. That seems like a long time ago. Um, the legislature provided $2 million in funding for this purpose in 2019 with an annual base appropriation of 1 million annually. This bill would increase that funding to $3 million a year. And this one can award grants to any owner of a manufactured housing park that provided that they abide by the contract requirements established by the Minnesota, by MHFA. Um, Victoria Clark from North Country Cooperative Foundation will address this proposal. NCF was a primary proponent of the original legislation. And um, I would note that the preservation of manufactured housing communities is the most cost effective housing strategy that the state can enact. And I did get a text from um, Jen Nelson. It was 2017, not 19. Yes. <laughs> I, I was going to guess that was a, that was a that case. Uh, so we have, are, are you ready for the testifier? Yes, Madam Chair. So Victoria Clark from the North Country Cooperative Foundation is here. Uh, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Victoria Clark. I'm the executive director at North Country Cooperative Foundation. Um, and we've been active in the manufactured housing sector since 2004, uh, when we completed our first conversion of a manufactured home community working with the residents of Sunrise Villa uh, Cooperative in Cannon Falls, Minnesota. That was our first uh, manufactured home community that we worked with. And since that time, uh, we've converted nine manufactured home communities to co-op ownership across the state, serving a little over 700 households. And uh, before I, uh, launch into my uh, testimony, I do want to make a shout out to the Manufactured Housing Working Group, which is a, a bipartisan, bicameral uh, group of legislators, including Representative Cagle, um, uh, who has really championed the reforms and the preservation uh, programs for manufactured housing across the state. That group has been absolutely instrumental in both the creation of this and establishment of this fund uh, that we're talking about today in 2017. 
um, and many other efforts. Uh, so I wanna thank all the legislators that are part of that, that work. Um, as Representative Cagle mentioned, one of the biggest uh, challenges facing manufactured home communities across the state is aging infrastructure systems. Um, you know, all manufactured home communities, predominantly all um, the, the infrastructure systems, including water, sewer, roads, electrical is all privately owned. So these are like little small cities and many of them built in the 1950s and, and 60s. So they're reaching the end of their the these systems if they haven't been rehabilitated and maintained over the years are reaching the end of their useful life. And the failure of these systems is the, the primary cause of, of, of uh, community closures, uh, which we have seen an uptick in uh, since the state started tracking those closures. Um, uh, I believe they started tracking park closures in 2015 um, or no, 2005, if I'm not mistaken. And our organization has personally worked with um, our, our client co-ops to complete over $4 million worth of infrastructure improvement projects, including two most recently, one in Medelia, Minnesota, one of our co-ops in Medelia and one in Worthington, Minnesota. Um, and uh, those projects were funded uh, through the first round of funding from this Manufactured Housing Infrastructure Fund. Uh, so we're already putting these dollars to good use uh, in, in preserving these, these systems and the affordable housing uh, that they support. And we do have $5 million in our own pipeline um, uh, across our portfolio of co-ops that we support over $5 million worth of um, uh, infrastructure improvements that are necessary. Um, so just in our existing portfolio, you know, we have enough projects to, uh, for many years. Um, and I think that the, the best example of the need for an increased appropriation into this fund uh, really is demonstrated by the, the sheer amount of applications that were received by Minnesota Housing in the first round um, of proposals. Uh, that first round of funding was issued in fall of 2020. And the funding awards were made in, in uh, just before the holiday, uh, the, the holiday break in, in 2020. And Minnesota Housing received nine um, applications, uh, funding proposals to that first round, um, of which there was $2 million available in that first round of funding. And they, the agency received over $5 million worth of applications. Um, and they were able, the agency was able to um, uh, approve funding for uh, uh, $2.6 million, even though there was $2 million available um, with the work of the Manufactured Housing Working Group uh, a couple of years ago, we, uh, uh, we received expansion of the housing infrastructure bonds. So the agency was able to do a bond sale of 600,000 to support, to go over and above the $2 million that they had in that appropriation for that fund. Um, so they uh, were able to stretch it across those five proposals. Two of those projects funded were um, in our resident owned communities, which I mentioned in Medelia and Worthington and three were for privately owned um, uh, communities. So, you know, the needs are great across the state regardless of, of the type of ownership um, and this fund serves them all uh, uh, equally. So a uh, great amount of need and, and serving communities across the state. Uh, it's worth mentioning that in addition to bringing dedicated resources to these types of projects, we also need to address the timeliness of being able to access these funds. Um, right now, the RFP schedule for uh, this fund is scheduled for once a year, which makes it uh, challenging, especially for new projects. Uh, this is something that we're in conversations with Minnesota Housing about, but it's, it's worth mentioning um, that and, and that's the case for a lot of these um, appropriated uh, uh, funds for particular uh, types of projects across the state is the timeliness of when we can access the funds. And once a year RFP schedules make it challenging for developers uh, for, for obvious reasons when they're working on a time bound project. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll thank you for hearing this important bill. And we look forward to working with our existing and future client uh, co-ops to put these dollars to good use, improving these infrastructure systems um, and in doing so, improving the quality of life for hundreds of low-income homeowners across our state. And I look forward to any questions that you may have. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Worth, do we have questions? Uh, committee members, uh, this would be uh, questions of either the bill author or of the testifier. Mr. Worth. Yes, Madam Chair, Representative Ryer has a question. Representative Ryer. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative Kegel, for bringing this bill forward. Uh, I think it's really timely to make sure that we can keep these communities as communities um, and let them uh, get restored and flourish. Uh, my question is about whether we are considering the creation of new communities. Uh, I've heard, I, I 
am not recalling any testimony about that over past hearings, but it seems to me that it's an affordable option for expanding existing housing or the whole housing stock. My in-laws have lived in manufactured housing for decades. Um, I've seen the deterioration, but I've also seen the benefits. And, um, and so would be interested in how we can leverage this whole approach. Thank you. Representative Cagle, uh, do you want to take that or would you like your testifier to? Madam Chair, I think I'd like to address one piece of it and then let my um, testifier um, address the other. I think the thing that we, uh, you know, manufactured housing is affordable housing um, if we can get it to real property status, I guess, um, or, you know, make sure that we can have um, right now the the people with who have manu who are looking to buy a manufactured home um, don't qualify for traditional housing lending. And so um, it makes it a it more expensive. Um, even though it, it is an affordable housing product, the terms of the loans are not affordable. And so um, I think, you know, if we can start to address some of those issues, um, I, I could see in the future that more, um, you know, manufactured home communities would pop up because it would be a more attractive um, housing option for people. And I don't know if Ms. Clark has anything to add on that. Ms. Clark, do you have further to add? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, Representative Cagle is right on uh, with the need to, uh, uh, you know, make reforms to how manufactured housing in a land lease setting, so in, in a park setting, in a community setting, um, where you don't own the land uh, and, and improving that. And, and we are working, this committee heard a bill um, uh, to, to reform how manufactured homes in a resident owned community are titled. Uh, so we're hopeful that that gets passed this year because that that's a critical part of the piece of the puzzle here. Um, and so if, if we're successful in, in um, uh, achieving those reforms uh, this year, like Representative Cagle, I suspect that uh, it's gonna make the value proposition for the creation of new manufactured home communities um, uh, far more attractive. It's a very affordable option. Uh, we're in conversations with several um, municipalities and, uh, and different HRAs across the state about this approach. Uh, so we're excited to do a, a new uh, project. Uh, we're just looking for the the right uh, uh, the right piece of land and uh, and pulling the pieces together on the single family finance side um, related to that title reform. But yes, uh, you know we're raring to go to do a new project, and um, uh, hopefully we'll we'll have more to report next year this time on uh, uh, on a new manufactured home community project uh, that's a co-op right out of the gate. Uh, the last community that was actually established and developed in Minnesota, I believe, was in the early 1990s. So we're due for a, for a new construction project of a new manufactured home community. Follow up, Representative Ryer? Um, no, thank you, Madam Chair. Any further questions, Mr. Worth? Madam Chair, there are no other questions in the queue. Are there final comments from Representative Cagle? Just want to thank everybody for hearing this. I think this is vital to make sure that we keep that stock of affordable housing um, as the previous bill was talking about. And so I um, would appreciate all your member support. And uh, House File 1282 will be laid over. Thank you. Now we have House File 1416. Representative Hassan, would you like to move your bill? Yes, Madam Chair. Representative Hassan moves House File 1416, and this bill will also be made over. Representative Hassan, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. For many, the scariest part of 2020-2021 crisis has been how quickly it laid bare the structural flaws in our society, whether it's economic justice, social justice, or racial justice. Pipeline communities across the state were caught in between two pandemics, COVID-19 and racial inequities that left many people people in the pipeback communities behind. I cannot put enough emphasis the importance of stabilizing neighborhoods, communities, and supporting everyone who have a place they call home. We have heard over and over the gaps uh, around home ownership between pipeback communities and white communities. We also know that home ownership comes with plenty of benefits, including but not limited to wealth creation. Research indicates that children who grew up in a family that owns their home do better in school than children whose families are bouncing from one neighborhood to another. <laughs> we are in the midst of housing crisis and we, all, we need all hands on deck solutions. 
House File 1416, which is a bill that provides $5 million from the general fund uh, for a grant via Minnesota Housing Finance to the one family, one community to establish program to acquire vacant or foreclosed properties that may be used for residential housing uh, purposes and to prepare uh, to pre-design, design and construct or renovate housing to be sold to persons with uh, an income less than 50% AMI with priority given to 30% AMI. With that, Madam Chair, I have two housing advocates who will explain to us how important this program is and how it can help our communities. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, I have Melita Timmons first for One Family, One Community. Um, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record. Good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Melita Queen, Melita Kimmins. I am the executive uh, director and founder of One Family, One Community. Continue. Uh, I would like uh, to just mention how important it is for this bill to be uh, recognized and passed. And I would like to thank uh, Representative Hodan uh, for supporting us. Uh, this matter is a very serious matter for us uh, particularly on the north side of Minneapolis, um, we are aware that um, there is a housing crisis and we're asking that we take vacant and foreclosed properties and bring some value and some access and equity uh, to the community. Uh, we could do this by taking some of those properties which are at CPED, there is a list of vacant properties there and we would like to take those properties and incre uh, also create um, and establish uh, a no uh, interest loan, such as what Habitat had originally uh, had in their program and uh, also work with families whose credit scores may be low. We also would like to work with families uh, that wanted to do contract for deed as that would uh, from MHFA has say, stated that they would also create uh, such a first time home buyers uh, advantage. And so we want to be able to uh, put people into homes. Uh, we understand that we started with uh, 120 uh, in, uh, people in encampments and now that number has rose to 22 and 2200. And so we would like uh, to this bill to be considered because uh, we believe that there is a, such a housing crisis that it will help uh, our housing stock that is already there and help put uh, families uh, into a affordable and safe place. Also, um, the impact on these communities uh, with these houses that are just sitting blight in our community, we've noticed that uh, West Havenbrook was able to come uh, from that list that CPAD has and take 400 houses and put those houses uh, into renter's warehouse. Uh, there we begin to see some rent gouging going on where people that you know work two and three jobs aren't able to really um, have any access. And then they weren't even able to become uh, renters uh, with, with rents that were astronomical. So we would like uh, to have that uh, considered that that is a disparity caused uh, when, when people are thinking about home ownership and trying to move uh, the, the gamut just a little bit uh, for African-American people. Um, and we, we'd like uh, to also consider uh, that rehabbing and construction uh, from those places, from, from that vacant list, uh, probably is uh, ideal for people to come in and put sweat equity uh, with that. I've also brought um, Coach Jamil from uh, Change Equals Opportunity uh, because we have worked with uh, Jamil Jackson in the past uh, and so uh, we had, we've already started doing small developments in the community. Uh, and so I would like to also uh, ask that he be heard and also uh, Mr. Uh, Todd Gramez from Black Lives Matter. 
Okay, I have uh, Todd Gravins, uh, Minnesota resident. Uh, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair, for giving us this opportunity. My name is Todd Gravins. Um, I'm a graduate from the University of Minnesota, uh, and I have two degrees, one in economics, one in management, emphasis in finance, and I am the leader of Black Lives Matter. Um, this is a crucial moment uh, for our community, especially BIPOC, Black Indigenous people of color, having an opportunity to have access uh, and creatively have funds appropriated so we can truly help our people. These rehab homes that are all through uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and the entire state, um, they are limited, but there are other entities that do have access to homes that are sitting that we can uh, renovate and give opportunity. So essentially what this program allows for is effectively finding a way where we can help people become homeowners and utilizing the current housing stock, the opportunities that are there with homes that were currently built in like around the 1970s. Um, also understanding that it is cheaper to actually uh, fix these properties rather than bulldoze them it's the opportunity cost. Um, so this program uh, specifically addresses that, um, focusing on people who are at 30% AMI as a, a, a very uh, big piece of this, because what we're running into is family members that are down uh, at the Dorothy Dare in, in a homeless situation where they have multiple paychecks uh, but that they can cash or what have you, but they're saving them to show proof that something's holding them back. So we've created a kind of plan where we will find those people and assess those people's needs. Uh, this program is intended to help at least between 20 to 50 families. Um, this ask is not very high, but it's also something, a creative way where we can truly help our communities uh, find that balance of stable housing. Um, stable housing in our African-American community has just been obliterated by COVID-19. And as we see that, um, the statistics really go show to prove that. The only real true way of helping our people is like housing is a cure. This is an opportunity uh, to give people in the community uh, hope um, and show them uh, that sweat equity as we see an uptick in crime. I do know for a fact that having a, an opportunity for people to become homeowners, show pride in their community and have stable housing is the the, the pioneering piece of bringing success back into communities and prosperity within communities. And it is a crucial time for a uh, legislature um, to truly hear out um, you know, the outcry of other community about how this program in and of itself uh, stands alone in the aspect of giving uh, youth hope. Uh, so there's been initiatives over in North Minneapolis as well uh, along the lines of uh, uh, guns down, hammers up. Utilizing youth to show them how to uh, finish uh, a house, what that means, and remodel these homes and get them out of these current situations where there's bad environment involved and getting them into something positive. And we've uniquely been able to do such a thing through this kind of idea. Um, and so now we just want to take it to another level. And so this would uh, uh, allow more funding to help us directly effectively take youth uh, and other adults alike to teach them the ropes on how to become homeowners, but also give them hope because a lot of the COVID-19 restrictions have allowed for people to have to separate. Um, and so the normal things that kids would do in the community, like play basketball, play with their friends, play sports, all of those things have now been limited. This is also like a mindset thing of, uh, allowing us to social distance and rehab these properties in such a way um, we creatively are doing it um, to incorporate people that live in that community. The idea of having a deed for sale um, and offering this to community members is crucial because then they can um, work on their way to home ownership. And that's the kind of longevity behind this program is to uh, for people in their certain communities to be able to have a stake in that um, and then also have build pride in that and to help uplift these communities, uh, any community that truly is struggling um, with housing. Does that, does that conclude your testimony? Conclusion of what, um, you know, I would like to say. So thank you. Thank you. you.
Thank you for your testimony. And now we have Jamil Jackson from Change Equals Opportunity. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record. Called CEO, which stands for Change Equals Opportunity. Our focus is on the mentorship of males of color aged 12 to 25 in the areas of education, employment, and life skills. I am also a consultant for the city of Minneapolis Office of Violence Prevention. Do you have a little more volume that you can give? Oh, there we go. Is that better? A little better. Okay, I'm sorry. I am also um, a consultant for the Office of Violence Prevention. Um, and I am a teacher within Minneapolis Public Schools with the Office of Black Male Student Achievement. Uh, I'm here to testify on behalf of this bill because I believe it is very instrumental for our community to get some assistance with uh, housing for our youth and our, our families in need, um, as it's been spoken on and testified uh, before me, um, there's a strong need in our community for housing for our youth. The biggest uh, piece that, that we face in the community of violence prevention is that of housing. A lot of our youth are running around in the streets with nowhere to lay their head at night, uh, nor a, a, a way to create an income that allows them to be sufficient enough to sustain housing. Um, I, myself, through my organizations, we only hire youth and felons, um, and we use uh, interior remodeling. I own an interior remodeling business. We use that as a way to mentor youth, to teach them about entrepreneurships, uh, generational wealth, and uh, just life skills in general. The biggest uh, conversations that I have, again, are about homelessness and where to sleep at night. We spend a lot of our money, uh, myself and Queen, on getting renting hotel rooms for these, these families and these young people who can't find stable housing because of their track records or because of their inability to raise enough money for the, the price of rents that are, are spiking out of control. Um, I believe that this bill will allow us not only to open the door for uh, more home ownership of our younger people to create that generational wealth, but being an, uh, uh, I'm sorry, being a contractor, I'm seeing these houses that do have equity in them being sold off market before they're even allowed uh, for general public to see for uh, for our community to invest in those properties and, and to be able to get that equity and gain generational wealth. Um, so I truly believe that this will be a benefit for our community holistically uh, moving forward to stop crime, to create generational wealth, and to allow our families to see the fruits of their labor uh, as it relates to home ownership. And I'll end there. Thank you for your testimony. Um, and members, uh, are there any questions of either our testifiers or the bill's author? Mr. Worth? Madam Chair, Representative Howard has a question. Representative Howard. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Hassan and to the testifiers for bringing uh, a really innovative uh, bill forward. And it just strikes me how much it, uh, uh, it hits on many of the sort of values that we care about in terms of creating opportunities for our youth um, while also creating pathways to home ownership in particular for our BIPOC communities. And I just wanted to make a comment about an article I read in the paper uh, this morning uh, that focused on the current home ownership market. I believe the headline said it's insane uh, because of just how many, um, just the mismatch of supply and demand and how any sort of house that's coming on the market is getting dozens of offers, the price is being driven up. Um, and I just had a conversation with some realtors this week that talked about what a challenge this is causing, especially for someone who's trying to get into home ownership for the very first time. Um, somebody might have access to a down payment assistance uh, program, uh, but for a seller, it may be easier to, to go with a cash offer or easier to, to pick a, uh, someone who's able to, um, you know, skip some of the inspections or, or what have you. And it just what struck me is how much that if, um, if we allow sort of market forces or the status quo to continue, things aren't going to get better, they're going to get much worse. And so uh, proposals like this that aim to uh, focus where our solutions need to be in terms of our home ownership equity gap, um, and ones that think outside the box, frankly, are, are super uh, well received by me, and I think they should uh, move forward. And so thank you for bringing the bill forward, Representative Hassan, and to the testifiers for all your work. Thank you, uh, Representative Howard. Uh, Representative Mr. Worth, do we have any other, anyone else? Madam Chair, Representative Agbaje has a question. Re Representative Agbaje. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Representative Hassan, for bringing this bill forward. I just want to uh, continue to lend my support for it. I um, have also met with the testifiers before, and I'm really glad to see that, you know, hopefully that this is something that can come to fruition. It's especially needed um, in neighborhoods in my district. Um, you know, I walk, walk around and drive around and see, you know, the homes that could be available that are unused right now, that are left vacant. And so a program like this would really be helpful to the housing stock that we have to kind of save what we have and rehabilitate it and make sure that we do have um, affordable housing for more people um, across the state of Minnesota. So I'm really, again, grateful for, for that this bill is being brought forward. Um, and I think it also speaks to the fact that it will help increase people's um, peace of mind during this time period to know that they have a safe and stable place to live. Um, I recently had a town hall with Commissioner Ho and, and a director of Catholic Charities, and they talked extensively about how this is one of the main issues causing mental health crisis because people don't know where they're going to stay. Um, so this is just a brief question. I don't know if maybe this was touched on already, but if one of the testifiers wants to just speak to the um, how, like how many homes have you guys seen that are that would be affected by this program were it to be implemented and how many do you think you could get up going right away? Would that be for Ms. Kimmins or Mr. Grimmins? Ms. Kimmins. Kimmins? Ms. Kimmins? Thank you, Thank you again, uh, uh, Madam Chair and uh, Representative Agave. Uh, I believe that uh, what we have researched and found was there was a total of 700 vacant homes located in the city's department at uh, the community planning and economic development. We would be able uh, to do at least 20 of those homes uh, and have those ready within, mm, I would say so far we've been doing uh, that in 60 days. We would, I would say given the, if we add it, uh, those 20 homes, we would need at least uh, 90 days uh, to get those uh, operable and brought up to code. Uh, again, we noticed that there was 700 vacant properties. However, West Haven Brook, had, which is an out of town company, was able to come in and purchase 400 of those vacant homes and turn those homes over to renters warehouse. And uh, that just really crippled North Minneapolis because some people who are paying, they were paying like $900 for a two bedroom are now paying $1,800 working two and three jobs per uh, household. Uh, and that really kind of, it, it really gouged the rent, the pricing for people on afford, affordability. And if I, and I said this, to say that if you can pay that kind of money for rent, you should be able to get into a first time home buyers, which also qualifies contract for deed uh, for ownership. And so uh, based on that, based on those numbers, uh, based on what we've researched, we there's 300 and some odd homes. I wanna say 331 homes uh, now sitting on the vacant list right now. Representative Agbaje, follow up? Uh, no, thank you, Madam Chair. Right. Mr. Uh, Worth, any, any others? Madam Chair, no other questions in the queue. Repres Representative Hassan, final comments. Thank you, Madam Chair and members for this opportunity to present to you to something that I think is an organic solution to a problem that is persistent and continue to be a challenge for all of us across the state. Um, I think this, this program is unique um, in its own way. It it's going to help stabilize communities. It's going to help youth. It's going to build um, and, and, and stabilize our neighborhoods. And also not to mention the skyrocketing rent that people can't even afford. So with that, I ask for your support. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative Hassan. House file 1416 is laid over. Members, this is the a time in the session when we start parking vehicles in different places. And uh, you might see that the next two bills are um, chaired in the, um, authored in the Senate by Senator Dreheim, who chairs the Senate um, Housing Committee. 
And so we have a couple of vehicle bills just in case. And I'm going to now hand over the gavel to Representative Howard. Chair Howard. Thank you, Representative Hausman. Would you like to move your bill? I will uh, move um, House File 2226 be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. Is there any discussion to this bill? And Mr. Chair, uh, just e even though we aren't providing, uh, you know, the, the amount is yet to be determined and where this bill goes, but I thought just because the program is before us, I would say just a couple of uh, sentences about um, this program. The Workforce and Affordable Homeownership Development Program was created in 2016 to help increase the amount of workforce and affordable homeownership projects throughout Minnesota. It was established to provide one-time grants for the development of this type of housing, serving households that make 115% of the area me median income. Uh, as I said, it, it's, uh, we, we don't have an amount in here because it, at this point is, is a vehicle. Members, are there any questions? If not, then I think we can proceed to a vote. Uh, I will Lopez, renew my motion take... that House File 2226 be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. Thank you, Representative Hausman. Mr. Wilcox. Howard. Aye. Hausman. Aye. Tice. Aye. Big <clears throat> Badger. Aye. Lips excused. Gomez. Aye. Hassan. Hassan. Hassan, aye. Thank you. Heinrich. Aye. Her. Aye. Jurgens. Aye. Olson. Aye. Barr. Aye. And Ryer. Aye. Mr. Chair, that's 12 ayes and zero nays. Thank you, Mr. Wilcox. The bill is referred to the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, Representative Hausman, you have the next bill as well. Yes, Mr. Chair, I will move that House File 2227 be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. Representative Hausman uh, moves that House File 227 be passed and referred to Ways and Means. Representative Hausman, to your bill. Yes, um, I'll, I'll just speak briefly about the challenge program, which I believe uh, was the uh, idea of Representative Gunther uh, from uh, Southern Minnesota. I sort of recall that I've always given him credit for that. The challenge program was created in 1999 to address the workforce housing shortage across the state. This fund is one of the most flexible programs administered by MHFA and awards grants and deferred loans for a variety of eligible projects, including both rental and owner occupied housing. The goal of the program is to help provide the workforce housing needed to enhance economic development. The program has income limits of 115% AMI for owner occupied housing and 80% AMI for rentals. Um, and as I said, um, no, no dollar amount in this bill. Are there any questions for Option of Hausman? If not, would you like to renew your motion, Option of Hausman? Mr. Chair, I renew my motion that House File 2227 be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. Mr. Wilcox, please take the roll. Howard? Aye. Hausman? Aye. Tice? Aye. Egbadjie? Aye. Bliss, excused. Gomez? Aye. Hassan? Aye. Heinrich? Aye. Her? Aye. Jurgens? Jurgens, aye. Olson? Aye. Barr? Aye. Ryer? Aye. Mr. Chair, that's 12 ayes and zero nays. And the bill is passed and we referred to Ways and Means. Uh, that is the last bill on the agenda for today. 
so members, please look to your email for uh, an announcement about our next meetings. And we believe that targets are coming out next week. So uh, the, the legislature marches on. Uh, and with that, the committee is adjourned.